Close encounters. People have reported them since the beginning of time. Clearly there are events that have been recorded that defy explanation. There is a growing network of investigators. So out over this field there. Searching for answers about extraterrestrial contact. Or maybe dark gray, something mm -hmm. like that. And unidentified flying objects. We can clearly see that this craft was from another world. I feel convinced that we are not alone in the universe. It wasn't 30 seconds, I mean, after they told me that I had a piece of metal in my arm that I knew where it came from. I want to know the truth. I want to know why these beings are here. I'd like to know where they come from. They say information is being withheld from us. We know they're lying. They're stonewalling us, man. Because the readings do change quite a bit right over. There's no indication how the animal died, what killed it, and what happened to it in terms of the disfigurement. Follow these UFO investigators on the trail of a mystery that has eluded us for thousands of years as we journey into the secret world of close encounters. metallic cylinder hovers over a suburb outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. In the skies above central Mexico, an object appears to move erratically between the clouds. Hey Sue, take a look at this. A sequence of brilliant lights burn in the sky over a mountain range in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, what do we got? The orbs form a boomerang shape as if they line the edge of a triangular craft. Oh my God. More than ever before, Look at that thing. People are looking in the sky and wondering, are we alone in the universe? Oh, there it is. There's the old one. Triangle. Here is something which is observed by citizens around the world. Every language, culture, nation, and there's nothing else on the planet that has that kind of reach. However, people are pretending like nothing's happening. National UFO Reporting Center, good afternoon. But according to a worldwide network of UFO investigators called ufologists, something is happening. The number of reports coming to us clearly is on the increase, and it tells us what we think we've known for well over 50 years in the field of ufology now. People are seeing anomalous objects on a regular basis, and they are now much more willing to come forward than has been the case in the past, we think. The National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, receives 50 to 100 UFO sighting reports every week. Members of law enforcement, pilots, firefighters. We're getting reports from all of these categories of citizens in the United States. One of the most credible recent UFO sightings came from a Lebanon, Illinois police officer. Early on the morning of January 5th, 2000, Officer Ed Barton was on night patrol when an unusual call came over the radio. I just received a call from Highland PD, reference to a truck driver, and said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. It was like a two-story house. It's a joke, right? Did they say if the truck driver was a uh, UI or anything? She said he was serious. Just a quick question. If I happen to find it, what am I supposed to do with it? And then I saw what appeared to be two very bright, very large white objects almost touching. The light was so intense, it was massively bright, and there was white light coming off of them. It is nice. There's a very bright white light east of town, and it keeps changing colors. I wasn't sure if it was a plane going down or not, but it didn't appear to be a plane. And I advised the multi radio that it was definitely was not the moon and it wasn't a star. My father was active duty Air Force. They got to the point where I could basically tell you what type of aircraft it was just by the noise of the engines. Stand by one. I had never seen something like that before or since, and especially where it made no noise, and all aircraft that I know of make some noise of some sort or another. Officer Barton raced to the other side of town, trying to intercept the unidentified flying object. I pulled up and stopped right next to the 21 mile sign. The object came towards me over the tree line. It was a humongous black triangle with one light in what appeared to be the nose, two lights in the rear with one red pulsating light just forward, 
and in the middle of the two rear white lights. It was heading northwest, and then it turned and sped off towards the silo area. The officer radioed ahead, hoping others might verify this unbelievable sight he was witnessing. There's a shallow off to look up, they can probably see it by now. Yeah, I see something, but I don't know what that is. I've got that object inside also. Are you serious? It's huge. 15 miles away in a town called Highland, 66-year-old Melvern Knoll, a miniature golf course owner, was heading home for the night when he spotted a brilliant light moving in his direction. I happened to look toward the northeast up in the sky and I thought, well, that's an awful bright star up there and why wow, that's moving, coming this way. So I just kept my eyes on it. I thought, well, what the heck is it? But when it got closer, I could see that it looked like a two-story home up there floating right over the treetops here. And as it got right in line with me, it seemed like it slowed down a little bit and like I put a beam on me, scared me. Between 4 and 5.30 a.m., a total of 15 people, including five law enforcement officers, reported seeing these crafts over parts of Illinois and Missouri. As with most UFO claims, not everyone believed the story. I know I'd get a lot of joking and ribbing and kidding about it, and that's why at first I wasn't going to call or even report it. <laughs> yeah. If it would happen to me, I wouldn't have admitted it to anybody. I probably would have kept it to myself. Forrest Crawford and David Marler are members of the worldwide nonprofit Mutual UFO Network. This is his business right here. Based in nearby St. Louis, Missouri, the two researchers heard about the incident. He was back there when he saw the object. And launched an investigation to try and determine what was behind the sightings. Where it's going to take you, you never really know. Is it going to frighten you or not? Is it going to amaze you or not? Some people will see a strange object in the sky and the decision that they'll make about it will be to go into denial because that's more comfortable than admitting that it might be something otherworldly, other dimensional, alien, or just something that they couldn't explain. So this is all black, dark blue, maybe dark gray, something mm -hmm. like that. Crawford and Marler conducted interviews with all eyewitnesses willing to come forward. Came up here. And these were so bright that I had to squint when I looked up at it. Comparing eyewitness accounts is essential to determine if the UFO could have been a misidentified jet aircraft or an unusually bright star. You said that there were six windows on the side of the object. Yes. It had like a penthouse up on top of the two-story windows, a smaller little room up there with some windows there. Okay. Confident that the testimonies were credible, Crawford and Marler set out to identify the origin of the flying object. That's interesting. We don't jump to the conclusion that everything unknown is an alien spacecraft. The stealth blimp seems to match the basic characteristics of what the police officers reported. But according to Officer Barton's account, the object could move at supersonic speeds. I give our government lots of credit for doing advanced research in propulsion systems, but I don't think they put it on a blimp and had the blimp do a rapid acceleration. The team contacted nearby Scott Air Force Base to see if they had been testing an experimental aircraft that night. Their response was that they didn't know of any military aircraft flying in the area and that the only calls that they had received regarding the incident were from the media. Sir Ed Barton estimated it was probably just about a mile, if not directly over the base, about a mile to the north. So right, because he did talk about this it on this side of the tower, didn't he? Right. Because you can see the tower peaking at night right. flashing up. Either they're being deceitful or they're just misinformed. The search for evidence so began at the site where Officer Barton saw the object hovering closest to the ground. Right out in there. Okay. Probably about a good 500 yards or so in. What are you picking up right now, Gary? Nearby transmitters. It's uh, become more difficult to uh, get readings because of the power lines in the area, to some extent. But the uh, transmitters also are being picked up by this. The ufologist team scanned the area for residual electromagnetic traces, but their meters registered nothing unusual. The investigators were disappointed, but they know that evidence of an extraterrestrial aircraft is rare and hard to support. Science is trying to pull back that veil of the unknown. And I think that that's why I like UFO research so much, because it's chasing something that's very elusive, seems to be intelligently controlled, and is as yet basically unexplainable or undefinable.
Dr. Michael Shermer is the publisher of Skeptic Magazine and a self-proclaimed debunker of UFO sightings. It's not that interesting to me to say, well, these people are wrong, although it's necessary to do that occasionally. More important is to ask, why is it that they are so convinced this is real when there's no evidence for it? And it has to do with the fact that the human brain evolved to be a pattern-seeking machine. We look for and find patterns in nature to try to make sense of our world, and then weave stories to put them in context. We're pretty good at that, good enough to survive as a evolved primate species, but not so good that we don't make mistakes that we do all the time. What exactly hovered over these Illinois fields is still a mystery, but this wasn't the first time a triangular-shaped aircraft has been sighted. Hey, Sue, take a look at this. On the evening of March 13th, 1997. All right, you tell me what it is. Thousands of eyewitnesses reported seeing a mysterious craft hovering over the city of Phoenix, Arizona. The thing that puzzles me is they can't be ordinary streetlights. This brilliant display was videotaped by several residents that night, while city officials and the military deny any knowledge of the event. Isn't that weird? Look at that. Next, the most confounding close encounter since Roswell. I don't know what they were. I know what they weren't. And the search for alien evidence ventures into the human body. I feel pretty confident that uh, we have a piece of metal that is not from this earth. UFO sightings have occurred since the beginning of time. Rarely, however, have thousands of people experienced a sighting that can be confirmed by multiple witnesses. During the second week of March 1997, many residents of Phoenix noticed strange lights in the sky every evening around 9 o'clock. There were two of them very close together. Then these girls start screaming, there's another one. I pan the video, one lit up. Three of them all together. Then another one, another one, another one, until four in a row were in the sky. And I just thought, this is amazing. I had a hard time believing that this was happening. Major sighting here. 40 miles to the north, Mike Christen was also videotaping the lights above Phoenix. Submitted for your approval. What have we got here? I was excited because I was finally capturing something on, on tape that I could show somebody because I've been telling people about these things for years and nobody believed me. A commercial airline pilot and his wife were driving home when they saw the lights and stopped to watch the event. They have chosen to remain anonymous. And I've been flying for 30 years and I'm used to looking up in the sky and knowing what I'm seeing. And so uh, as it went overhead, I went, eh, it's not a flight of fighter, so it must be a heavy aircraft. And it struck me that no, it's not a heavy aircraft because there's no sound. Then the realization hit me that, wow, I don't know what I'm looking at. I was terrified. And when I saw how big it was and how dark and it looked to me like it was blacking out the stars and everything, and it just a no, no sound it was probably the spookiest thing that I've ever experienced. In the weeks following the sighting, both Luke Air Force Base and the National Guard said they had no information on the source of the UFO. We all got calls asking where our aircraft were that night, and we all checked, and none of our aircraft were in that area. We thought this was funny because here's a huge object that flew down the entire state of Arizona and part of Nevada. Military doesn't know anything about it. This is a threat to our national security. This object penetrated our airspace. Several months later, the military abruptly reversed itself. As we looked onward a couple months later, we found out we had visiting aircraft or TDY aircraft. Another spokesperson reported on the local news that the aircraft belonged to a visiting National Guard unit that was dropping flares. Each aircraft had to make one final pass over the range to jettison those flares. It's just a, a potential answer. We're not saying this is the answer. We're just saying this is yet another piece of the puzzle that could explain those lights. I've um, dropped those flares um, from my aircraft in Vietnam. I've been on the ground in Vietnam when those flares have been illuminating us and I've also seen them many times as a fighter pilot as they're illuminating the target area and uh, an aerial flare is very distinctive in that it uh, it flickers it it's very bright it turns night into day. Jim Dilatoso is a Phoenix resident and a longtime UFO investigator who analyzes UFO footage with computer imaging. He examined five different videos of the Phoenix lights to try and get some answers. We know that they were not flares. Flares don't fly in a formation overhead. Whatever everyone saw, it was not on radar. And the air traffic controllers in Phoenix that saw that object that night were stunned 
by the photos that we analyzed, we found it to be approximately one mile wide. There certainly seems to be some kind of a secrecy that's veiled over this, and I, I can't quite put my finger on what it would be, but it, it does seem to be something that's trying to uh, get us to believe that it's a very simple explanation. I don't know what they were. I know what they weren't. They weren't flares, they weren't airplanes, they were not a formation of fire balloons, they weren't holograms. So what are we left with? We're left with either a lot of people are lying about what they saw, or a lot of people are lying, covering it up. If it was extraterrestrial, it's something very different than any other kind of UFO sighting that's been reported before. In the months that followed, Court TV began to track the story, a first for the U.S. justice system. Now, a UFO activist group is suing. They're suing the government, saying it did not search hard enough for an answer. It's inconceivable to me that the Department of Defense, whose responsibility is security and intelligence, does not have any information on this object. In early 2000, criminal lawyer Peter Gersten, founder of Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, set out once and for all to get answers about the reported sightings over Phoenix. The Phoenix lights over the city of Phoenix was but one episode, one event where this object was seen. It was seen in the Hudson Valley in New York throughout the 80s and almost on a weekly basis in 1987. It was seen in Belgium in 1990. This object is seen so often you would think that, that it would be the lead story and it would be the number one priority to identify this object, especially in the age of terrorism. We have an absolute and unconditional right to know the truth and that's why we go into court with our lawsuits. Gersten filed suit against the Department of Defense under the Freedom of Information Act. When the military argued it didn't have any information on the Flying Triangle, the judge ruled that Gersten could see what was in their files. However, when they complied with the ruling, the Department of Defense provided only a small list of keywords it used to search its database. This is Peter Gersten. Can I speak to Scott, please? Gersten again challenged the government's response, and the Department of Defense asked the court to have the case thrown out. Yes, I was. He wanted my fax number so you could fax me the uh, judge's decision. The attorney and many who followed the case eagerly awaited the ruling Thank you. and the truth about the Phoenix Lights. Okay, here we go. History in the making. So it's going to be a detailed decision, so that's, that's for sure. So it might set precedent no matter what he finds. After weeks of legal wrangling, the judge ruled for the Department of Defense, and the case was dismissed. But the military had been challenged, and Gersten vows to continue the fight for government disclosure. It's hard to believe that the Department of Defense has no information on what this object is. They know what this object is. They've been studying the object. If it's not theirs, then they know whose it is or what it is. It, it's just, it's really, I think they're lying. There's no question about it. It's just, it, it's ridiculous. When you videotape something and you have evidence of it, and you call the local military and they tell you, we don't care. Don't call us, we don't want to hear about it. And they give you a different story every day and they're just lying. We know they're lying. They're stonewalling us, man. We don't want to hear that, we want answers. Uh, this is the Hudson Valley one, May 1988, 9.30 p.m. Does the government not tell us everything that they're doing, particularly with military top secret aircraft? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Does that mean it's extraterrestrial? No, it doesn't. And in fact, it, it, this is probably the explanation for the Phoenix Lights and so many of these sightings. Our government, uh, for reasons of national security, is not going to tell us everything. To date, the government has not released any information about what took place over Phoenix in March 1997. The truth about the Phoenix Lights appears to be locked away, along with thousands of other close encounter events. But not all close encounters can be so easily ignored. Some claim they have evidence that aliens are abducting humans for nefarious experiments. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest. May these gifts just be blessed. Amen. 
Tim Cullen is a cement worker who lives in Yuma, Colorado with his wife Janet, a registered nurse. A recent x-ray revealed a strange object lodged inside Cullen's body. He has no puncture wound or scar, but there is a repressed memory of a terrifying event in his past. It was at 30 seconds after they told me that I had a piece of metal in my arm that I knew where it came from. Coming up, an unusual surgery reveals a mystifying object. Looks like a boy to me. <laughs> and a UFO hotspot hides a dark legacy. There is definitely intelligence behind the animal mutilations. And there's a purpose. And there's a motive. In the secret world of close encounters, stories have surfaced of people being taken against their will by extraterrestrials. One who claims to have been abducted is Tim Cullen. In May 1978, Tim and Janet Cullen were driving home from Denver when a bright light appeared on the horizon. Wow, look at that. Suddenly, an unidentified flying object hovered right in their path. It was large and cylinder shaped and had multiple lights. It wasn't a helicopter and it wasn't an airplane. It wasn't anything I'd ever seen before. What is that? Wow. It's gonna cross right over the road. And the craft seemed to come back up toward the road. As it did that, I felt telepathic communication with the creatures inside. Has it changed me? Yeah, it's changed me. Uh, do I find it easy to talk about? No, it, it'll probably never be easy. Because I know what I'm saying. Tim believes the encounter led to his abduction, and although he has no recall of the experience, he believes he received an implant that continues to be monitored by aliens. My arm used to buzz. The buzzing sensation was more regular and getting more intense. And uh, as I was aware of it, I, would kind of, I felt that it would be aware of some of my thoughts at times and my emotions and react to those. Worried about the sensation he was experiencing, Cullen met with a doctor who examined his arm. An x-ray revealed that Tim had an object embedded in his left wrist. I believe it's possible that this certainly could be an alien implant. I've been around Tim for the past almost 24 years, and whenever he's had an injury or a splinter in his finger, I've been there to remove it for him, and I think I would have known about it if he would have had an injury. Reluctant to expose his experience to his personal doctor, Cullen turned to the internet. One year later, his search led him to Dr. Roger Lear, a California podiatrist. Dr. Lear removes objects that patients suspect have been implanted by aliens and provides his service for free. I am 100% convinced that, uh, number one, these objects are placed uh, in the human body by someone or being using a technology which far exceeds our because we do not have the ability to put something in the body without making a portal of entry that's and that's just where it starts dr lear carefully screens all his patients before considering an implant removal the individual must have a conscious recall of some involvement uh, with a ufo uh, or an abduction scenario over the years, the number of qualified participants have multiplied. Tim Cullen meets the criteria and agrees to travel to Los Angeles to have the object removed by Dr. Lear. Okay, when Tim had the surgery scheduled, I really wanted to go along with him because I'm a registered nurse and I wanted to make sure that everything was done, you know, the right techniques were followed, but yes, I was apprehensive about it. I am not afraid of anything no matter how they come at it or what they do. I figured they'd studied me for 20 years. Couldn't prove it was an alien implant until it was taken out. <laughs> you can say what you want, but you gotta have proof, you know? Tim didn't want to tell anybody the story for 20 years for fear of reprisals against uh, him and his family. This was a very uh, compelling uh, human uh, scenario which uh, propelled me into doing something for him. The day of the surgery, a group of ufologists and journalists assemble to witness the event. 
General surgeon Dr. John Matriciano is on hand to perform the procedure. He is skeptical of making an alien connection to a piece of debris found in the human body. I'm basically a non-believer. You know, I think it's somewhat arrogant of us to think that if there were some creatures that come see us. Don't breathe too much, you're going to pass out. Cullen is numb for the entire procedure. I'll make a small incision right here, not a big one. Did it hurt you? No. Twenty minutes later, a quarter-inch object is removed from his wrist. According to Dr. Lear, the first abnormal sign is the lack of a cyst surrounding the object, which in 20 years would have grown to the size of an almond. In a normal situation where a foreign body has been inside the human body for a prolonged period of time, there's a fibrous cyst called an inclusion cyst that forms. In this case, there was none. Looks like a boy to me. <laughs> but Cullen's humor belies the importance that the object might mean in proving the existence of alien life and contact with the human species. The object is placed in a plastic vial containing plasma from Cullen's blood to preserve it. To secure the evidence, the implant is sealed in a tamper-resistant vial in front of witnesses. Dr. Lear takes the specimen to be analyzed at Digital Instruments, a research laboratory near Santa Barbara, California. They agree to their first alien implant examination, viewing it as an opportunity to put their new atomic force microscope to the test. So that's the sample here, and I'm going to put in on a bit of epoxy here. Dr. Irene Ravenko has a PhD in biology and is also a medical doctor. Under the microscope, the so-called implant appears to have some unusual traits. I've never seen really this kind of pattern. I would guess that people who work on material science can see this kind of structure on some metal, maybe. But in biology, I've never really seen anything like that. Puzzled by the lack of a fibrous cyst, she probes what looks like a thin membrane encasing the object. We just got a little piece of this material and we're going to let it dry in, dry in air. Um, this is what we get after a few minutes in air. And this part here is still very squishy, very soft. If I press on the other part of the tissue here, it's very hard. It looks like a resin, something like a plastic. I've never seen this before in human tissues. A second opinion from a government laboratory that chooses to remain anonymous found the object to be highly unusual, amorphous and magnetic, a combination that does not exist in any form of metal today. Exactly what this object is remains unclear, but Dr. Lear is hopeful that each removal brings us closer to the source of these objects, whether earthly or not. Some of the things that we found in the implant surgery, such as the membrane, which seems to allow a foreign object to be placed in the human body and prevent the human body from rejecting it, I think is the most important thing. And if we could understand this better and duplicate it, why we would have a tremendous benefit to medical science. Though the tests are not conclusive, Cullen still believes the implant is better off in the hands of science than in his own. I'll tell you what, that research on the membrane has made me feel real good. I think it's the only truly piece of this puzzle that we can solve for right now. People around him have been very supportive. I was kind of, I guess, naive, thinking, well, we'll go to California, and if you have this removed, and then we'll just go back to our little life in Yuma, but that's not the way it's been. Tim has wanted to get the word out about what happened to him and to get more people aware of it. It's definitely different <laughs> than life used to be. This is a donation can for Tim Cullen, sending him one way to Mars. All donations is welcome. Tim, I'm going to present this to you. Well, thank you, Mary. Since the surgery, Tim Cullen's tale of an alien abduction has made him a celebrity and a curiosity in Yuma, Colorado.
Although he knows many are skeptical of his story, Cullen says the event was real and it's happening to others. I wonder if anybody here tonight has had any experience. Any Barbara Lamb is a regression therapist who specializes in treating patients who believe they've had contact with aliens. This is a picture of my family, my extraterrestrial husband and my two hybrid sons. She witnessed Tim Cullen's surgery and says the time has come for people to accept the possibility that abductions are occurring. Be as open-minded as possible about the fact that these very unusual things are happening. I think that there has been a lot of prejudice about UFOs and extraterrestrials and people who claim to experience these contacts. Whoa. Yeah, that one's, oh that one's the one. Let me see the one. That one's wow. the one. That's my husband. <laughs> Her weekly support group has been growing steadily for five years. I just had um, this really large headed being with this low chin um, take me on a ship and then they put me back down. The people can discuss their own experiences and compare notes with other people. And when they talk to other people who've met some of the same beings or have had some of the same procedures happen, and yet these people who seem to be very normal, likable, functional people, that's very reassuring to each one of the experiencers. At least allow for the possibility that this could be happening because indeed so many of us do have a true sense of knowing that this is indeed real. This is the ETs from Roswell. As members of the group share memories, they often find similarities in the types of experiences they've encountered. I remember different times uh, over the years being taken to on board, uh, appeared to be a ship and taken to a nursery and shown children. Sandra, I think something happened for you. It hurt. It hurt. It made me feel totally out of control. I, had, I, I could not do one thing about it. I, I, I knew that, they, that I had a baby and they wanted it. And I felt so afraid. 500 years ago, people had experienced demons uh, coming into their rooms and harassing them and molesting them at night uh, in their beds, for example. 200 years ago, people experienced uh, ghosts and spirits doing this. We experience aliens doing this. It's all the same phenomena. The brain interprets it in terms of the context of the culture in which you live. That's where your memories come from. And since we live in the age of science fiction and Star Wars and Star Trek and real exploration of the solar system, um, then of course that's what's on our mind and that's what's in our collective memories are aliens. That's a mute there. Found in a potato barn. Humans aren't the only ones supposedly having encounters with aliens. Animals are being killed and mutilated in a cycle of mysterious serial killings that have lasted more than 30 years. Yeah, look at that. Uh, the heart was taken out. They shredded it and brought it through the ribs. Next, are aliens abducting and mutilating animals? I've seen so many of these cases that I think the average person would be horrified. Colorado's San Luis Valley is a melting pot of Old West ranchers and New Age seekers. It seems the last place on Earth to harbor a dark legacy of abduction and death. Because the readings do change quite a bit. A rash of unexplained animal killings in the western United States right has ravaged the, the ranching community for more than three decades. The bizarre crime spree has been largely ignored by scientific and law enforcement communities, leaving only a handful of investigators who doggedly pursue the case. Denver area police officer Ken Storch has logged hundreds of hours crisscrossing Colorado's San Luis Valley, searching for evidence to the mutilation mystery. During his service as a sergeant in the Air Force, Storch says he witnessed a UFO incident and was forced to sign a document preventing him from disclosing details of the incident. Although he won't discuss specifics, Storch says the event launched him on a lifelong quest to uncover the truth about close encounters. I think my 26 years in law enforcement allows me to bring a perspective to the phenomena and investigating it. There are certain questions that have to be asked. Who, what, where, and why? 
We know where, but it seems that the San Luis Valley is a hot spot. And it's a reoccurring event. As to who, we don't uh, have that information. As to why, we don't have a motive. But we know it's happening because we have hard physical evidence. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of cattle, horses, deer, and dogs have been found butchered. What's more, UFOs are reported to frequent the area. Seeking answers, Storch sought out a local journalist, Chris O'Brien, author of two books on the San Luis Valley. Welcome back to Paradise. Hey, thank you. O'Brien has investigated sightings, alleged close encounters, and numerous animal mutilations in the area. The one that smelled like disinfectant, and they left the, the liver and the heart. Mm -hmm. Took the brain out, the brain case was dry. The brain was gone. Yeah, 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 and it was dry. There was nothing inside the skull. There was one drop of blood on the rear left hoof. That was it. And it was found in a pristine snow field, five inches of snow. The a classic mutilation generally features soft tissue organs that have been removed in a very unusually precise manner from the animal. Usually it's a mandible is exposed. The, the jawbone is bleached white. Um, oftentimes the rear end and the genitalia have been cored out. That's, yeah. Yeah, look at that. Uh, the heart was taken out. I don't know, they shredded it and brought it through the, through the ribs. The ribs are intact. There are no tracks. There are no splatters of blood. There's no pieces of hide. There's no indication whatsoever how the animal died, what killed it, and what then subsequently happened to it in terms of the disfigurement. Some of these cuts are so precise that even the hair on the hide is cut down to an eighth of an inch. Now, I defy you to show me a predator that can cut hair. Here's what I think. You went that way, the way you did. Yeah. And then you went this way. Some suggest a dark cult might be responsible. Others say, because of the laser-like incisions found on the carcasses, our military is involved. There are also rumors of an alien connection due to the high incidence of UFO sightings. Go ahead and get a a reading for magnetic anomalies. After being on? called out on the number of, of potential cases that I have been called out on, I've seen some horrific animal deaths that um, defy scientific law enforcement or, or even a rancher's explanation of number one, who killed the animal and how was the animal killed and then what happened to it. I've seen so many of these cases that um, I, I think the average person would be horrified. This is a really strange case that uh, just that just freaked me out so bad. By the time I got there, the, uh, the animal's body heat had melted the snow. But there One of the most disturbing cases O'Brien investigated was on the ranch of John Har. Late one night in 1994, the rancher heard a sound outside his home and went to investigate. According to Har, a silent black helicopter with no markings hovered menacingly, then flew off. The next day, Har was out inspecting his herd when he came upon four dead cows. One was mutilated, unlike anything the rancher had ever seen. I got off and I looked at her, her sex organs were removed. They were cut out, uh, real, real fine cuts, and they were taken out. But even more unusual than that, her face, uh, along the jawbone and all the major jaw areas, the skin had been removed in a real fine straight line. It wasn't a predator, it was something that was very unusual. My wife said, well, that cow's been mutilated. Now, is it a coincidence that he should have a big silent helicopter hovering over his house, beating the tops of the trees, and then he goes out and finds these, uh, these disfigured animals? Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. I think that this is a very complex scenario. It may be the military. They may be involved in some cases. It may be aliens. We don't know yet. I think if this was easy to solve, it would have been solved many years ago. There is definitely intelligence behind the animal mutilations. There is something that, or someone, that is directing it, and there's a purpose, and there's a motive. When you see an animal that's been drained of fluids, and major organs have been removed from the animal with not, without a single drop of blood, it's very difficult for you to not get kind of a strange feeling up the back of your spine about it. What are the chances that some super advanced, technological, intelligent, moral beings from another planet have somehow managed to traverse interstellar space, which is enormous? They manage to land, and what is it that they do? They cut out the sexual organs of cows to take them home. That's it? Seems rather unlikely. Seems more likely that predators 
have attacked these animals. It's easy to deny obvious explanations for things when you want so badly for the other explanation to be true. The more mysterious, the paranormal, the extraterrestrial explanation. It's more titillating than the idea that, oh, a dog did it or the vulture did it. That's not very interesting. There's a crime being committed. Ranchers, farmers are losing money because someone or something is doing something to their animals. And I think law enforcement needs to take an active role in trying to come to some type of conclusion as to who and why it's being done. But as far as that alien connection, we don't have the smoking gun to, to make that connection. Next, one of the most credible UFOs ever caught on tape. With our naked eye, we could clearly see that this craft was from another world. For reasons that are still unknown, reports of paranormal phenomena like close encounters proliferate in certain locales. The guy who designed the inertial navigation system for stealth, he lives right here. He says on real cold winter nights, he can look up and he can see a light just below the tops of the moons. He says, Chris, I don't know what the heck's up there. He's not sure if it's ours or somebody else's. The San Luis Valley has a long history of sightings dating back to 1917 when an unidentified airship was reported hovering over Salida, Colorado. Now, almost a century later, local inhabitants continue to report UFOs. In August 1995, Tim Edwards was in his yard when his daughter Brandy pointed to an object in the sky. Brandy started telling me that, Daddy, there's something up in the sky. And uh, we watched it probably for a couple minutes before I went in the house and grabbed my video camera. With our naked eye, we could clearly see that, you know, this, this craft was from another world. Tim watched the huge UFO for over an hour and filmed it for six minutes. He believes whoever was piloting the UFO was aware of his presence and wanted to be observed. As I was videotaping uh, this craft, overwhelming feelings came over me and uh, I felt it was very important for the world to know the truth and I, I went on a mission for about three years uh, to get my story out to the world and I was successful in doing that. Tim's sightings prompted him to open his own restaurant catering to people hungry for UFO information and updates. UFO investigator Ken Storch often swapped stories with Tim at the popular diner. That one there was supposed to be taken in Jerusalem uh, about five years ago. A lady took a picture and that came out in it, uh, according to the story. Having a close encounter of this type basically uh, put my body into emotional shock and trauma for a while. It was a very uh, a spiritual thing. The fact that uh, we're definitely not alone. People who claim to have had close encounters often report a drastic change in their consciousness. Maybe this explains why they are so passionate about what they've experienced. If you're lucky enough to have a close encounter, it'll change your life forever because you just can't go back to your normal life the same anymore. With me, uh, it's an adrenaline rush, especially when you're recording it on video so the rest of the world can see later. It's just become a part of my life to see these things and I look forward to every sighting, whether it's tomorrow or three years from now. I'm patient and I'll wait. And I know it'll be there, and I'll be there with my camera. You hear the stories of people having sightings or close encounters or unexplained things in the sky. And I feel really privileged to have seen this V-shaped formation of lights that night. And now when I'm flying at night, I tend to really keep an eye out. I think that there is some kind of interaction going on that's uh, unexplained and hasn't been sufficiently addressed to the public. Clearly there are events that have been recorded by scientists that defy explanation and our understanding of how physics works. Yes, I think there's something occurring here that has not been explained fully to the public. I have a sense that um, with the advent of the camcorder age and the advent of the, you know, the age of information, more and more people have access to more and more data. And the more people are brought up to speed, educated about this type of, these types of mysterious events, I think the more we're going to find that there is an interconnectedness between all these mysterious phenomena, whether it's Bigfoot, miraculous healings, um, UFOs, animal deaths, I think at some, on some level there is a connecting point.
If you have a close encounter with an object or an unknown entity, and you have no rhyme or reason or no explanation or no reference to that, it's going to affect you. It's imperative that we continue the investigation, and it's imperative that the scientific community stop and take a hard look at what's going on and look at it comprehensively. And I think that the data that's going to be coming forth is going to be so overpowering and so compelling that mainstream science is going to have no choice but to take a hard look at it. Yeah, I think that day's coming. Perhaps it's our destiny to search for an answer to our greatest mystery. Are we alone in the universe? It's only a probabilistic argument that there are so many stars, a couple hundred billion in our galaxy alone, a couple hundred billion galaxies in our universe alone. You know, what are the chances that we're the only one? Seems unlikely. That doesn't mean that there are aliens, but it seems anthropocentric and narrow-minded to think that we're the only ones. Until irrefutable evidence is found, if ever, ufologists will keep watching the skies to uncover the secret world of close encounters.